All right, good afternoon. Welcome to today's live recap. So let's jump into the trade plan and what the market context was heading into the open. Now, we knew from Friday's price action that the market had closed on short-term strength. And now, heading into the open this morning, the question was whether buyers could hold ES above the 92 to 94 initial support zone. Now, our short-term bias was neutral, which means that we had to be open to the market moving in either direction. But off the open, how the market behaved at 92 to 95 would provide us with a tell as to which side was being more dominant. A break below that area would be the first warning sign, which could lead to 84 quarter to 88. And then if that zone failed to hold, then that would serve as a bearish confirmation and we would need to see broad market weakness and sustained downside momentum in order to get a directional move below 84 quarter to 88. On the upside, we had the pre-market resistance at 99 half to 2800 half, and then the main area of resistance was 2902.75 to 04.75, and we would need to see broad market strength and sustained upside momentum in order to get a proper breakout above that zone. So until the market put in a proper breakout above initial resistance or a bigger breakdown below initial support and below 84 quarter, our directional bias would remain neutral. And because it's neutral, we would have to pay closer attention to how the market was developing in real time and then give that more weight. So that being said, let's jump into today's chart. So off the open, the market pushes down into the 92 to 95 initial support. And we know from the morning plan that this is an important short-term inflection point. Now, as the market comes down into that zone, what we don't know, and we never know, is whether the zone is going to hold, right? So we're not in the business of predicting whether the zone is going to hold. But what we do know in real time is that we're not seeing any major warning signs or any uh, red flags that would suggest that the zone is not going to hold, right? So at the very minimum, it's a 50-50 bet whether the zone will hold or not. Now, it might even be more than 50-50 given that the buyers have been more dominant recently. And if we look at uh, the one-minute chart here, you can see at the tick, it's completely above zero. And if you were watching the other markets, then you'll notice that uh, the NASDAQ was actually rallying uh, fairly early off the open. And it took out its overnight high fairly early off the open as well, while the S&P was still at uh, the initial support zone. So at the very minimum, we can say pretty safely that there's a 50% chance, you know, at least a 50% chance that this zone can hold. So the next question is, if the zone holds, where can the market go? And we don't have to be super aggressive with setting our target, right? Because remember on the upside, pre-market resistance and initial resistance are still valid areas of resistance. And uh, the main area of resistance being the initial resistance zone. And we don't know if the market's going to break out, right? It, it may only get to initial resistance or pre-market resistance. We don't know that in real time. But what we do know is that if 92 to 95 holds, then on the upside, we're probably going to go to pre-market resistance. And then we can also test initial resistance without the market changing its recent structure, without the market doing anything significant, right? So when it comes to targets, one of the things you want to think about is how much effort is going to be required for the market to hit your target. How big of a change is going to be necessary in the underlying market structure in order for your target to get hit. Now, for pre-market resistance or even initial resistance to get hit, the market structure doesn't have to change. So what I mean by that is that there doesn't need to be any big breakout or breakdown type move in order for those zones to get hit. 
So those serve as high probability targets if the zone is going to hold, right? And again, we're not trying to figure out is it going to hold or not. We're just saying that if it holds, then the market can go to pre-market resistance and initial resistance. And all of this ties in with the idea of trading for expectancy. And this is something that we all need to be working on. We need to be mindful of this. And it's going to make the decision making in real time a hell of a lot easier when you don't have to be overly predictive, right? When your focus is purely on accuracy, trading becomes quite difficult because now the focus is not on the long term and we are going to end up putting a lot of emotional and psychological capital into this outcome of this one trade, right? And the reality is that we don't know the outcome of the next trade. If we knew the outcome, we would not use a stop loss and we would bet the entire account. But the reality is that we do not know the outcome of the next trade. And that's where risk management comes into play. And that's why we have that stop loss, right? Is that, hey, if we're wrong, then it's a small loss. No big deal. It's, it's an acceptable level of risk that we have already determined before we put the trade on. And we should be completely okay with losing that capital if the trade doesn't work out. With the understanding that over the long run, over a larger sample size, the trades that work out will overweigh the trades that don't. So when it doesn't work, I lose a dollar. When it works, I make two or three. I don't need a huge win rate for the math to work out on that one. So coming back to this idea of expectancy, um, I just put together this little quick um, spreadsheet to just use this example of today's initial support and dive into this idea of expectancy a little bit more and kind of see it in a more black and white way, you know, and not have it be this, uh, this kind of vague concept that we just pay lip service to, you know, let's kind of dive into the numbers and really understand how we can use this idea to improve our decision making and put on better trades over a larger sample size, right? Again, it's not about this trade. It's about having a process that's going to yield positive results over a longer term. So these are kind of the variables that we need in order to figure out what the expectancy is. And expectancy is simply the average return you can expect over a larger number of trades, right? So if I follow this trade setup, if I take this particular trade setup with this win rate and this risk reward, then what is my result going to be after 100 trades, for example, right? So for the win rate, we'll use 50%. The stop loss has to go one point beyond the zone, so 2891. And for the target, for this particular example, I'm being super conservative, right? We're using 99.5 as the target. So the pre-market resistance zone, which is, again, a very conservative target. Um, I think even initial resistance was easily uh, a spot that could get tested. So, you know, it could be even better, but for the sake of this example, and just to kind of illustrate the idea, I'm using 99.5 as the target, and then I have a minimum stop in place of one and a half points. So, um, you know, at the very minimum, I want that to be my stop loss. For example, you know, for the 2892 entry, if I don't have a minimum stop, it'll, uh, it'll say the stop loss is one point, and that's not real because I never use a one point stop, right? For me, Usually even the minimum is two points, but over here I'm using one and a half, which is still acceptable, right? So even if you're taking a trade at the back of the zone, usually you want to have at least a 1.5 point stop because if you're taking it at the back of the zone, there's probably a good reason that you were waiting for the absolute best price. And in those situations, it usually makes sense to give the trade a little bit more room. So we'll set the minimum stop to one and a half. So you can see that if you enter at the top of the zone at 28.95 and you're targeting the pre-market resistance zone, you're risking four points and your reward is four and a half points. The risk reward ratio is 1.13. And based on these numbers, right? If you took a hundred trades, right? 
the expectancy per trade is 0.06. And keep in mind that in this calculation, I am not taking commissions into account. So really, I mean, this would be a losing proposition, right? And the net result after 100 trades with this particular setup would be six and a quarter R. And again, that's without commission, so it would probably be a lot less than that. Now, if I enter at 94 half, look at how the numbers change, right? Now my risk goes down three and a half points. My reward goes up to five points, right? And my risk reward ratio goes to 1.4. My expectancy all of a sudden becomes 0.21, much better than the entry at the front of the zone, even though there's a very minor difference between the two. Um, 28.94, now I'm risking less, right? I'm risking three points and I'm getting five and a half on the target. My uh, risk reward goes to 1.83. Now on our end, the minimum that we shoot for is two to one, right? So if we're taking a trade, we want our target to provide us with at least two times our risk. So these entries are not really the ones that we're gonna be going for, right? 94, 94 half. Uh, that's not what we're looking for. We want that minimum two to one reward to risk. So this is a way that you can actually figure out where within the zone it makes sense to place the trade based on the target. And again, we're using a pretty conservative target. You know, we can change this to even, you know, 2901, 2902, closer to that initial resistance zone. And that way, even some of these higher prices would give you two to one reward to risk. But you can see that, you know, as we go deeper into the zone, the risk reward really starts going up, right? At 93, we're getting three and a quarter R. At 92 half, 4.6, right? At 92, five R. So as your risk reward goes up, now the win rate doesn't even have to be 50% for this idea to be profitable. Again, you know, we're saying it's at least 50% because there isn't really any big warning sign against it, right? Like if the market came down here and the tick was completely below zero, AD was like minus six, 700, you know, showing a bearish disconnect, then we would say, hey, wait, you know, this might not really even be 50% because there's a lot going against this trade. But in this case, we're getting good location, right? This is a trade that we can take at 93 or 93 half. And, um, even if it's a 50-50 idea, we know that over the long run, it's going to result in some fantastic results. And that's the idea that we really need to internalize, right? And it's not easy to do, but I think by doing these kinds of exercises where you really kind of understand the nuances and the changes in reward to risk and expectancy just based on the entry within the zone, it can give you a um, at least a head start in developing that expectancy-based mindset because you really have to kind of understand how expectancy works. You have to understand, um, you know, what the probability of the trade is. And we're not looking for an exact probability here, right? We're not saying this is a 67% chance that the market will do X, Y, or Z. We're just coming up with an approximation. And that's why when things aren't very clear in real time, 50-50 is usually a good probability number to use. So if there were a lot of signs going against this trade idea, you know, then we might say, you know, it's not even 50%. In that case, it might only be a 35% probability, right? And the reality is that when you have 5R potential on that trade, then even 35% is actually going to be a profitable trade idea. So as the market is trading towards the middle to back of the zone, if you can really keep your focus on expectancy and not be concerned about the outcome of this particular trade, then I think you're more likely to pull the trigger and at the same time, not place so much emphasis on whatever happens next. Now, when it works, it's easy, right? You get in at 93, 93 half, you know, the market pops up to pre-market resistance. You can either take profit or you can scale out of your position uh, and reduce your risk by doing so. And then maybe you hold for the initial resistance zone 
or take some profit there and then see what happens, right? So how you manage the trade is going to vary from trader to trader. And you don't have to manage your trade exactly the way that I do. Um, everyone has their own level of risk tolerance and their own goals and objectives in the market. So the idea is not to simply, um, you know, copy exactly what I'm doing, right? You want to uh, take what I'm doing and kind of adapt it to your own, um, your own psychology, your own objectives for the trade. And as long as you're doing that, at least you'll be kind of heading in the right direction, right? So the idea is not to take the exact same entry, exit, all that stuff, uh, but develop the right principles to follow that process. Um, you know, you and I should have similar ideas, not the exact same idea, but similar entries, um, you know, similar areas where we're looking to take profit or we're looking to, uh, you know, uh, flip our trade and go the other way. We should not be on opposite sides on most days, right? So uh, it should not be that I'm long at 93 or 94 and you are short at 93 or 94, right? Now, once in a while, even that will happen. And the reality is that because we don't know what's going to happen next and because of the um, randomness that does exist in the market, technically, either of us can win on that, right? I'm not saying that I'm going to be right uh, on every single trade. But on most trades, if we're looking at the market through the same lens and we're trying to apply the same process, then we should come up with similar ideas at the end of the day too. So the main idea this morning is the long setup at initial support. The entry is not at 95, right? Because of the way the market was heading down, it just made more sense to look for a better entry, right? Not get in at 95, but to get involved towards the middle or back of the zone because that's where you're going to have the higher expectancy. Now, when it comes to trading the front of the zone, right? When do we want to do that? We want to do that when either the target is quite big or when we have a lot of things lined in the favor of our trade which means that our win rate or our probability of the market working in our favor is higher, right? So for example, if our short-term bias is bullish and our intermediate-term bias is bullish, and then the market comes down into initial support, well, that's probably when we're going to be okay with taking the trade even at the front of the zone because the odds are aligned in our favor, right? The probability is not 50-50, it's higher than 50-50. So in that situation, we're not going to wait for the back of the zone because it's a given that, you know, the back of the zone is always going to provide better reward to risk. But the back of the zone doesn't always get hit. So there is that decision making where, okay, where do I get in? Front of zone, middle of zone, back of zone. And a lot of it is going to depend on what's in my favor and what's against me. Now, when the short term is neutral, then we have to pay more attention to the real-time price action. And in the real-time situation, you know, the market had put up a swing high of 97 and now was breaking down below its little opening range, right? I mean, it was kind of still developing the opening range, but it was rejection at 97 followed by a move down into the zone. So in this particular situation, as the market's coming down, we're better off getting involved in the middle of the zone that way, even if the market only reaches the pre-market resistance zone or initial resistance zone, we actually end up getting really nice reward potential out of it. It's a high expectancy trade and it works out quite well. If it doesn't work, that doesn't matter, right? We don't want to really focus so much on if it doesn't work. That's what the stop loss is for, right? The whole purpose and benefit of having that hard stop in the book is so we don't have to spend so much mental energy on what if it doesn't work. That has already been answered via the stop loss. We don't have to really think about it so much because if you overly focus on what if it doesn't work, then chances are you're not going to get into the trade. And it's going to lead to indecision. It's going to lead to 
um, you know, just kind of questioning what the market's about to do. It's going to lead to an accuracy-based mindset and over-prediction on the smaller time frame. And usually the results are just not going to be what you want them to be. And there's always going to be this gap uh, between your potential, right, how much you could be making, how profitable you could be, what your performance could be, and reality of what is, right? Now, in my experience, when it comes to market reading and when it comes to execution, there's always going to be a bit of a gap, right? Um, I, I think that the market reads for most traders are going to be better than their executions. So there's always going to be that gap, but the constant work is on minimizing that gap. So it's not about eliminating it, right? Because you don't want to shoot for unrealistic goals. Um, usually your market reads will be a step ahead of your execution. You know, that's just a given and it's easier to just accept that and move on. But if you can minimize the gap between potential, between your market reads and your executions and reality, then you can be much further ahead, right? So as the market is trading at initial support, we're not thinking, yeah, but what if it doesn't work? What if it hits my stop? You know, yeah, but like there's a red bar that came down here and now it's like, you know, coming down again and the opening range high is still holding. What if it doesn't work? What if it just goes through? Well, if it goes through, it hits your stop, right? That's the whole purpose of having that stop. So you don't have to make that decision of what if it doesn't work. You're automating that side via the stop loss. So you can keep it relatively simple. Market's at a zone. It's at the initial support zone. It's good trade location. You know, I'm not buying the top of the zone. It's giving me an entry at the middle to back, which means I can use a relatively modest stop, probably only about two points, and get three to one on a move even up into the pre-market resistance zone and get four or five to one on a move up into the initial resistance zone, well, that's good enough. That's good enough to pull the trigger, take the trade, and then let the market do what it's going to do, right? Because none of us have control over the outcome of the trade. We can really only control our process of getting in. And as long as we're following a consistent process, we can expect relatively consistent results. One of the main issues with a lot of developing traders is that their process is all over the map, right? It's uh, inconsistent execution. It's an inconsistent process. And yet the expectation is for consistent results. And if you think about it just logically, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? If you are doing random things at random times, then how can you expect predictable results, right? You have to kind of do the same thing over and over. There needs to be consistency on one side of the equation here, right? So we have ourselves as the trader on one side, let's say, and we have the market on the other side. The market we know is not going to be consistent, right? There's going to be randomness. It's going to do things we don't expect. And that's a given. We have to accept that. But we do have control over the level of consistency that we bring to the table. So when we're inconsistent, you know, now you're, you're getting exponential inconsistency, right, in the results because you're combining your own inconsistency with the randomness of the market. But if we are consistent with our process, you know, we're doing the same thing over and over. And you have to do the same thing over and over in order for this expectancy idea to work out. Right? because you need a large sample size of similar trades. And if you're not following that similar process over and over again, then the sample size is not going to build up. Right, It's going to be different kinds of trades. It's going to be just a random uh, you know, set of trades. And again, you're not going to get that consistency that you're looking for. Everyone wants to be consistently profitable, right? not just randomly profitable. So... The way to get there is to develop this expectancy-based mindset and do the same thing over and over, irrespective of the short-term results. Now, sometimes we're going to have two or three losses in a row. You know, it's a given. That's okay. That should be accepted as well. 
But then at the same time, there's going to be more trades that hit two or three R. And one winner wipes out three losses, right? So when you have that kind of math working in your favor, it doesn't take a very high win rate to be quite successful. And because as day traders, we can have, you know, two, three, on some days, five, six trades a day, the frequency really matters. You know, the frequency is higher. So that means that we're going to have an opportunity to recover and recoup from drawdowns and from losses much more quicker as opposed to a trader who puts on, you know, two trades a month, right? Like it's going to take that trader longer in terms of time to recoup from a drawdown. But as a day trader, you know, you could be down one or two hours in the morning and then be up one or two hours in the afternoon, depending on the day, right? So that's the main thing that I wanted to talk about today. It was a fairly slow day, but you can see that the opportunity was still there. Initial support still provided a very nice entry on the long side. There weren't any major warning signs that were telling us to stay out of the market. And on the upside, when the market pops into pre-market resistance, given that it is a bit of a slow day, volume was fairly light today, it makes sense to scale out based on the way I look at the market and based on my risk management. And then once the market pops up into the initial resistance zone, we're not seeing any big upside momentum come into the market. The other markets are now actually hitting better areas of resistance. Well, that could be a time where you can take profit and just exit the trade. And even if you're not exiting a trade right there, let's say you exit a little bit later, that's still okay, right? It's still a good outcome given how slow the day was. And that's really it for the day. You know, after that, we're not interested in trading the middle. We're not interested in trading the chop. We want to secure a good trade location. Short-term bias is neutral. The market is in a very balanced, two-sided state. So we don't want to get involved in the middle of the range. So really, the only trade setup today is long initial support. You know, anywhere in the middle of the zone is okay. And then basically just scale out or take some profit at pre-market resistance, or if you want to hold it until initial resistance, that's fine too. But I wouldn't really overstay on this trade setup. I would take some profit uh, because this was not really setting up to be a high volume breakout type day. Um, I think today the other markets uh, more or less were catching up to the S&P because the S&P has been leading to the upside. And uh, so the other markets were kind of putting in a bit of a catch up move and uh, they weren't really putting in big breakouts outside of their recent ranges either. And that's why when the market pops up into initial resistance, it is a good idea to at least reduce risk um, and even consider just exiting the trade altogether because of the light volume and the lower opportunity potential in real time. So that is how today ended up playing out. Um, at this point, I'll just go through and take just a couple of questions. Uh, we're going to be doing more of these live recaps, by the way. So uh, if your question doesn't get answered, don't feel too bad. Just sign up for the next one and, uh, you know, we'll cover it then because I'm not going to have time to cover all the questions every single day. Uh, I think that's going to make the recaps extremely long and it's going to make it difficult for me to schedule these live recaps more often. If I can keep them at around 30 minutes, 35 minutes, then I can do them more frequently, which I think is what you would rather have too, rather than you know me do like an hour recap and kind of get uh, a bit burned out and then not do them as often. So uh, let me just go through and see if there's something quick that we can answer for today, uh, something that uh, really pertains to today. Um, all right, so Don is saying from what I saw, I had the probabilities well above 50%, more like 70%, and also had target uh, at 99 half. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to you know determining the probabilities, again, we're just looking for an approximation, right? I wanted to be super conservative on this example and just show that even with a 50% probability, you can do quite well. But yeah, I agree with you. You know, I think it was more than 50% too. It's It's difficult to put an exact number on it, but uh, I would agree that I think it was more than 50% too because we weren't seeing any warning signs, right? NASDAQ's holding up really well. You know, Russell isn't showing any big weakness or anything. You know, AD is kind of where you'd expect it to be. 
Um, you know, tick is holding above zero. So if you had to kind of stack the uh, signals or observations that were in favor of the trade versus those that were against the trade, yeah, I mean, there would be more that were favoring the trade rather than going against it. So yeah, I think, you know, it was more than 50%. How much more is questionable, but that doesn't really matter, right? It's not about getting an exact probability. It's just about kind of having a rough approximation and then using that in your decision making, right? So Paul's question is, can you go into a bit more detail on how you establish your profit target or targets? Quite often, it's based on the uh, zones on the other side. So if I'm taking a long setup at support, then I'm going to use the first couple of resistance zones as areas where the market could head and could test. But it does depend on the market context. For example, if the market is putting in a larger time frame breakout or breakdown where the market's going directional, right? Well, in that case, you know, the profit target could be much larger than just the first two zones. So in that situation, I'll usually rely on the range analysis. So if the market is putting in like a trend day or, uh, you know, again, putting in like a larger time frame breakout or breakdown and trending in one direction, that's where I'll lean on the range analysis and I'll say, okay, what's the range expectation on the 24 hour session? What's the range expectation for the RTH session? And then I'll try to find a zone that kind of coincides with that range expectation and I'll use that as the target. And that's why we can be quite aggressive on trend days, right? Is that the targets are usually much uh, larger on trend days. So we can be really aggressive. The probabilities are better on trades taken in direction of trend on trend days and the targets are bigger, right? And those are two main elements that make up expectancy. You know, the probability and the reward potential. When both of them are high, it's an easy trade. And that's why trend days, you know, once you really understand how to trade them, are really some of the easiest days to trade. So those are two techniques or two ways that you can determine the target. So John is saying that when the zone is strong and the signals are mixed but positive, is it wrong to split the order like one at 95 and one at 92 to average the entry? So John, I'm not a fan of that technique because um, I think it leads to sloppy execution. And uh, you can be in a situation where in some of the really good trades, you're only sized with half of your actual position size and you are guaranteed to be full sized on the losses, right? So like if the trade's not gonna work out, then both of those orders are definitely gonna get hit. But when the trade works out, that second order might not get hit. And now whatever your you know, outcome is of that trade, cut it by half because you cut your position size by half. So I'm not really a fan of splitting the orders. Um, I know that it feels better to be able to do that. It's less scary. It's, uh, you know, you're not going to miss the move because you'll get at least something off. But uh, the reality is that in the long run, the math is not really going to be in your favor. And again, I think it just leads to uh, relatively sloppy execution, right? Because now you don't really have to do the hard work of figuring out where in the zone it makes sense to take the trade. So it's easier to do it the way you're proposing, but I don't think that it's better. And it's not something I do. Haas's question is, any particular reason you always use TradeStation version 9.1 versus 10? And should we do the same? Um, I just haven't upgraded mainly because I don't want to uh, run into the risk of having any technical issues with the platform. Uh, and at the same time, TradeStation 10 is really just a reskin. Uh, there's, as far as I know, you know, I have TradeStation 10 on my laptop. And as far as I know, it's not like a major upgrade or anything. It's like the same features, the same charting, same everything. They just changed the layout and reskinned it to make it look a little bit more modern. So if it was going to be like, you know, a faster platform or if it was going to have some, uh, you know, other features that were going to be helpful, then it would make sense for me to upgrade. But the reality is that there's not that big of a difference between 9.1, 9.5 and 10. Um, 9.1 and 9.5 are very similar and 10 is just a different look, but it's the same charting underneath. 
So that's the only reason I haven't done it. Joel says, I've gotten much better on my entries and getting good trade location and picking proper invalidation points. My current struggle is overweighing the minutia of the advanced decline line and the other markets while I'm in a trade. Uh, what do you advise for not overreading the market or not trying to predict the outcome of your trade? So there are a couple of ways that you can handle this. Um, one way that has been helpful, and it's kind of an extreme way of doing it, uh, but for past students, this has worked pretty well, is I've had uh, traders completely remove the advanced decline for a week or two to see how they do just completely without it, right? Because from uh, my experience, it's not so much about training yourself to underweigh the advanced decline, it's more about overweighing the price action. It's easier to develop the skill of overweighing the price action and giving that more weight as compared to the advanced decline. And when you take the AD completely off of your chart, you have no choice but to give all the weight to the price action, right? So if you can train yourself to do that over a period of one or two weeks, now, how long it takes, I don't know. It's going to vary from trader to trader. But that is a way that I've tried in the past. And uh, I've seen some success with students uh, doing it that way, where you know they'll just completely remove the AD, really kind of hone their skill on reading price action. And then when they add it back on, they've had that practice of really giving the proper weight to price action. And then there's still a period of a little bit of struggle. There's still kind of a time necessary to calibrate and kind of, you know, bring that data back in. But that's one way that I've seen work for other traders in the past. And again, you know, every person is going to be a little bit different. So there's no like, uh, there's no guaranteed way of doing it. But that's one way that you could train yourself to give them at least the proper weight to price action, right? So for example, today, um, a question was posted on Twitter asking, uh, you know, do I think the high of days in or do I think the low of days in? And the reality is that we were getting mixed, uh, a mixed read in real time, right? So the internals were suggesting that the low of days in, but based on price action, we couldn't really say that, right? Because the market had not put in a breakout above initial resistance, which means that the market was still in that neutral state. So if we had gotten a breakout above initial resistance, then the intraday bias would have been bullish and the short term would have been bullish too. But because we did not get that breakout, the market was still stuck in a range from a price action perspective. So that's where you kind of have to weigh the two and say, well, price action is saying that we're still in a range. Internals are saying, yeah, the low may be in, but I need to you know, give proper weight to price action and those two need to be reconciled. And uh, that's why, you know, we're not shorting the initial resistance zone, right? We're using initial resistance to take profit, but we're not shorting initial resistance. That's the balance. That's how you can kind of balance the two where, hey, internals are saying lows in, but price action is saying that this is resistance and volume is really light. So how can I reconcile that? Well, at the very minimum, let me take profit. You know, I'm not going to go outright against it and short, but let me take profit. Sevak is saying, just a few weeks ago, placing the stop one point below the zone would be sure to get you stopped out. I understand that volatility is lower now, but aside from that, what indication did you have to believe that stop one point below the zone was good enough, given that we've been in a contracted range and overdue for more volatility? So that's exactly, you know, you're saying in your question, aside from that. Well, there is no aside, really. Um, you know, we base our stops based on volatility. Like volatility is one of the main things that goes into that equation. So when you're saying, hey, what about what about everything else besides volatility? Uh, I think it kind of uh, moves away from the thing that we should really be focused on. So in that environment, when we were placing our stops, you know, sometimes even three points beyond the zone, right? Well, that was in an environment where the daily ranges were, I think, averaging like 45, 50 points, right? I mean, it was a very high volatility environment and that's why in that situation, it made sense to use wider stops. But now that volatility has contracted, we can go back to our 
you know, kind of default practice of placing the stop one point beyond the zone. And keep in mind that if you're buying it lower within the zone, let's say you're buying 92 half, well, I mean, you can place a stop at 90 half. You can place a stop at 90, right? And it's still only a two and a half point stop. So you can have a minimum stop that you use. So, you know, for me, it's usually two points. Like that's the minimum I'll use. Even if I'm buying the absolute bottom of the zone, usually my minimum stop is two points. So that gives me just, you know, extra room for the trade to work out. So you could do it that way. It doesn't have to be like this mechanical thing where, oh, it's always one point beyond the zone. But if you're buying, you know, the middle of zone, you don't want to use an artificially wide stop just because you think, oh, what if, you know, the stop gets hit? Uh, because most of the time it's not going to get hit and you're going to be taking the hit of that cost, right? Because a wider stop has a cost to it. Now your reward to risk is going to be affected. Market's going to have to move more in your favor to give you that high reward potential. So, you know, there's a cost to using a wider stop. It's not free. Um, and most of the times, when the trade works out, one point beyond the zone is going to be fine. And when it doesn't work out, then even two or three points beyond the zone is not going to matter, right? So as long as you really understand that and believe it, then you can uh, confidently put your stop one point beyond the zone. But like I said, if you're buying back of zone, you know, put it two points beyond. That's okay. Uh, Vakar saying, I was waiting for price to hit the initial resistance zone to go short, but price reversed ahead of it. I think price reversed right at the zone um, at 0.275. It hit it and then it reversed. Uh, and he's saying, you know, is that a missed trade? If your idea was to short the zone a little bit higher, because that's where it made sense, that's where you were going to get your reward to risk, that's where the target and the stop was going to make sense for you, then I would not consider that a missed trade. Like, for example, this morning, if the market had reversed off of 95 and it didn't go a bit lower into the zone and I missed the trade, then I wouldn't consider that a missed opportunity at the zone. Now, if there's a lot of momentum, I might consider buying a pullback, right, to try to still get in the trade. Uh, but, you know, I'm not going to consider that particular zone fade set up as a missed opportunity because it didn't really hit the entry that I was going for, right? All right, guys, I think I'm going to wrap it up over here. There are a couple other questions, but uh, I think they require um, a longer discussion. You know, some of these questions are uh, questions that should have their own discussion, their own webinar, right? So uh, at this point, uh, I'm going to wrap up the Q&A. We're already at about 43 minutes on this call. So uh, at this point, uh, I'll just quickly jump into some thoughts for the overnight session, and uh, then we'll call it a day. So in terms of what happened today, initial support to initial resistance, you know, back down again. Um, the support zone is still holding, so that's a good thing for buyers. Our short-term bias is still neutral until we get that upside breakout beyond the initial resistance zone. But in terms of um, which side is more dominant, you know, there is still potential for buyers to uh, step in and push the market higher. Um, the other markets so far are holding okay. Uh, you know, we've seen some short-term strength come into the Russell and the NASDAQ. Uh, they're still lagging in, you know, comparison to the S&P, but uh, they're trying to catch up. So for now, as long as we're holding today's initial support zone, uh, I think that there's still potential for an upside break. But until we get that proper breakout uh, above 0275 to 0475, this is still going to be considered a very range-bound market. And uh, on the larger time frame, we would need a breakout above even the uh, 2915 area to... Um, you know, get a larger time frame balance breakout. Uh, right now, if we break above 0.275 to 0.475, then the market has potential to run up into the 29.15 uh, resistance. And if we break down below initial support and especially below 84, you know, then we can revisit 71.5, maybe uh, some of the support levels below that. But until we get that directional break one way or the other, um, you know, the market is stuck in balance. And that's why our short-term bias will continue to be neutral and we're going to have to continue to be flexible with our uh, directional view. 
and we'll just keep an eye on the other markets too. If we start seeing some unusual weakness in the other markets, you know, then we'll adapt and adjust accordingly. But uh, as long as the breakouts and the uh, recent short-term strength is still holding in the Russell and NASDAQ, you know, then today could just be a day where the other markets caught up. S&P kind of stayed where it was. And now heading into tomorrow, especially heading into Wednesday with a Fed announcement, you know, that's where we can get some real uh, directional conviction and some bigger movement. All right, guys, that is a wrap for today. Thank you to everyone who was able to attend live. And if you were not able to attend, that's perfectly fine too. That's why everything is recorded. All right, guys, take care and uh, I'll update you tomorrow morning. Good night.